Okay, so what I'm going to do on this video is to go through how to manage a ZFS pool, which if you remember from the introduction is like the middle tier, if you like. We've got the bottom tier, we've got all the hardware. The middle tier is the pool of disks. And then the top tier is the actual file systems to make use of the pool. Now, um, it's worth mentioning here that stuff you might read on the internet uh, might contradict what I say, or I might contradict what you what you might read on the internet. Uh, there's two things to say about that. I've found that on the internet there's a lot of uh, misinformation, a lot of lies, a lot of wrong things being said about ZFS, just not true. And the other thing about what you might read on the internet is that ZFS has been around a while now, um, and it's changed a lot. So what might have been true several years ago um, is is not true now with ZFS and I'll give you one example um, with RAID pools in ZFS for example a, a standard RAID pool you used to need three disks minimum uh, that was the absolute minimum and there were ways around of uh, ways around that if you did only have two disks but wanted to create uh, a RAID with just two disks were were ways around, around that now ZFS allows you to create a RAID with just two disks that is possible so things like that have changed um, there are other things to be wary of but um, in general I've, I've done a bit of research I'm pretty sure what I'm going to tell you is, is true um, so just bear that in mind if you think you've read something you think I'm wrong just just double check what's on the internet um, hasn't been superseded or, or it's just people stating stuff they know, don't know anything about. Um, the other thing I need to mention is the machine I've set up here. I was going to use one of my actual working machines, but um, it was too risky and it would have been down for too long um, for me to, to, to prepare for these videos and to actually do the videos. So I've set up a machine... Um, I originally did have four identical disks or one and a half terabytes. Um, unfortunately, one started showing errors and eventually just gave up um, the ghost. So I've had to replace that with a different size disk. It's not too much of a problem because it means I can demonstrate what, what um, happens with ZFS when you've got mismatched disk sizes. Um, the real killer is, though, that um, just this morning... Um, one of the other discs has been showing similar symptoms, so I'm hoping it's not too too bad that um, I'm going to have to change out or find another disc to replace with it, which will be another odd-shaped disc. But um, we'll see how we go, and hopefully it won't die on me while I'm doing the doing the videos. So, as I say, I'm going to um, show you how to do a uh, to do. Um, management of ZFS management of the pools. Now, as I say, I have got disks set up. If I do F disk minus L on this system, um, you'll have to also bear in mind that this system is quite old. It's an old P4. It is the last of the P4s, the Pentium 4s. It is a 64 bit one, which I completely recommend um, if you you know, dig out an old machine and it's only 32-bit, you will have problems. I I used to have ZFS uh, when it was a Fuse plug-in running on a Pentium Pro, 32-bit obviously, and it worked fine until you try to do too much with it that involved a little bit of memory. There's um, problems with memory allocation, I think it is. I think it's the way it's programmed. If you go on the um, ZFS on Linux website, I think it is, it tells you a bit about running on 30, but yes, it is possible, but you may have problems. I thoroughly recommend just stick to 64 bit, you won't get any problems with memory allocation. So, yes, it is a 64 bit machine I'm on, but it is like the very first 64 bit Intel, so it, it's a little bit on the slow side. Another thing is this disk that's dying because it's got lots of reallocated sectors, that's a little bit slow. It's actually this um, SDC disk here it's this one that's giving me the problems so you can see that these three are all identical models um, and that's the one that's giving me a problem this is the one I've had to replace as I did have four one and a half terabyte so I've had to replace the one that died with this one terabyte drive 
Um, so I will be using um, real discs. Um, if you haven't got this many discs and you're sort of umming and ahhing about spending the money because it you know it can be quite costly to go out and buy you know three or four discs to create a an, an array or even just two discs to 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 create a mirror mirrored system, um, it can quickly escalate the cost of it. Um, and I'll, what we'll be doing at some some point, especially early on, is I'll be using files ZFS works with block devices and obviously in Linux that means block devices it could be a number of things it could be USB sticks it could be files it can be real disks um, it could be CDs you know like DVD RAMs for example um, in theory I've never tried it but in theory it would work um, as they are block devices so whatever appears as a block device in Linux you can use that device in ZFS it, it will use it um, so as I say, I will be um, doing some of the demonstration with files purely because it's more convenient. For example, maybe to show what happens when the ZFS file system fills up. So I'll be creating small files so they fill up quicker. Um, but we'll also be doing demonstrations with real disks just purely because it's more realistic and also um, the data transfer will be a little bit faster because obviously they're separate disks rather than trying to write to four different files on the same disk. Um, now if you do use files as your block devices for ZFS, if you you know want to try some of the examples that I'm going to go through, uh, one tip I can give you, I haven't done it yet but I don't want to do it, is to use the wrong device and as you can see I've got a boot device, boot system on the SDA disk, the first disk. Um, I don't want to be overwriting that. I can't remember off the top of my head and I've been too cowardly to try it. I can't remember if ZFS warns you if there's a, you know, if the system's in use or if there's a file system already on the disk. So, um, as I've been too cowardly to try it. So what I have been doing, I've just rem been removing from the dev um, directory this device, so SDA. I've just been removing that. In fact, I could remove all of them. So that now if I do fdisk minus L, you'll see SDA is not listed anymore. I can't access my boot drive anymore. So it's just a little bit of protection. So you may want to think about doing that. Obviously, when I reboot, it will it'll reappear again. So it's not a problem. Um, you know, it's not a permanent thing, just removing that all those links those nodes in the dev directory so what I've done is I've created a separate directory to hold some disk images in and basically all these are just empty files so um, what I did was I created um, four disks that are a gigabyte in size in fact what I should do is create this last one a smaller size like I've done on my actual hard disks um, yes what I've done is just I've just done DD use DD in file equals slash dev slash zero so I'm going to read the device that supplies just the stream of zeros output file is disk 4 um, block size is 512 meg and just count is one so obviously to do 512 meg or as these which are a gig you're going to have to at least have a gigabyte preferably two gigabytes of memory otherwise it will probably fail or it will start swapping to um, the swap disk and it will slow things down so I'm just going to overwrite this disk with a half gigabyte file and just wait for that to write And that's written. Now, one there's one difference um, with uh, using files and using actual real block devices. If the device appears in the dev directory, then you can just refer to that device with its name. So, for example, normally if I do fdisk minus l. Uh, 
um, slash def slash stb I'll get the details for the stb device if I do stb on its own that won't work FDIS needs a a um, absolute um, reference to the block device that you're referring to ZFS is a little bit smarter in that if you supply a reference to a block device for example SDB it assumes that that's in the dev directory automatically so that means you can refer to block devices that are in the dev directory either by referring to them as forward slash dev SDB or whatever or just SDB so you can use the absolute or the um, uh, reference the uh, relative um, name if you like of, of the, of the uh, device if you're using files however because they're not in the dev directory you've got to supply the full path so when I'm referring to these disks these disk files here that I've created I've got to refer to them as forward slash root oops, forward slash ZFS and then the name for example disk1 so I must refer to them like that. I can't just refer to it as disk one. So although this will work because I'm in the disk, it won't work for ZFS. So as I say, it just means that ZFS and ZPool, ZPool in particular, the two main commands, sorry, ZPool to manage the pools and ZFS to manage the file systems. Um, but Zeppel mainly just will refer to any device in the dev directory automatically but any other device you have that's not in the dev directory you have to supply the full path so as I mentioned Zeppel is the command that we use to um, manage the ZFS pools you can type Zeppel on its own and you'll get a quick um, resume of all the commands that um, Zepool is capable of uh, using, of acting upon. And as I say, there's quite a lot here. And as I said before, I'll just be going through the commands that uh, I suppose the minimal you need to get by with using a Zepool um, and managing one. So what we want to do is to create a Z pool so we can start using it. And what we do is we do Z pool and the command we use is simply create. And after that, in fact, if I scroll back, we can go back to the create command. You can see how it displays it. The create command involves these switches another switch with property name, another switch with some system property names, a mount point you can specify, looks like there's a root mount point and then these are all optional and then the compulsory ones are the ones in the angle bracket so everything that's optional is in the square bracket, the ones that we must apply are in the angle brackets and the dot dot means that the previous um, specification the previous parameter can be repeated so that minus O parameter can be repeated this minus capital O parameter can be repeated the R minus M mount point can only be put in once as can the minus R and the pool and the VDEV so the pool can only appear once but the VDEV has got three dots after it, the ellipsis so you can repeat the VDEVs so we must supply at the very minimum a pool name and we must supply at least one VDEV um, I won't describe what a VDEV is just yet because they can be a little bit confusing because it's not there is a definitive way of describing a VDEV but a VDEV can be a number of things and the way they're displayed when you examine a pool it's not immediately obvious so I won't describe what a VDEV is at the moment um, you will see it appear, you will hear me mention the VDEV um, but like I said I think it will be, it's a little bit confusing so I'll, I'll mention what a VDEV is a little bit later on in one of the other videos it stands for virtual device, I'll say that much for now to give you an inkling of, of what it is but as you'll see when I do this create command 
I won't be specifying a virtual device. Specifying a virtual device, it will be a physical device. So as we say, we need to supply a name. So I'm going to call it test. That's the name of my poll. I've got a convention. It's an, just one I use myself. It's not something that somebody's told me to use or or any advice on the internet or anything like that. I create all my polls in capitals and then all my file systems in lowercase and that's just the convention I use. Um, you might want to stick with it, you might think it's daft. Generally people just tend to use lowercase pool names and lowercase file system names. But this is just the convention I use. It just makes it easier for me to pick out, you know, when I look at a, a, a path, I can see it's in capital so I know it's on a ZFS partition or a ZFS pool and also I know straight away without having to think which bits the pool, which bits the file system. So it's just me. Up to you whether you want to do that. So that's the pool name and now I need to create a VDEV. I need to specify a VDEV. Well in actual fact in this case the VDEV is actually the block device and as I said before you can create it with the absolute path which in this case is dev stb or I can create it with just the name of the block device without the path to the dev directory. So what I'll do is I'll do both just to show there's no difference. So pull create test dev stb. So similar to a lot of Unix commands and it doesn't report anything if it's if it's succeeded. So the fact that it's not reported anything you just assume it's worked and it's done it. How do we see what we've got? Well, we can do zpool status. And you see we've got a quick summary of uh, information about the pool that we've just created. So the pool, there's the name I created called test. It tells us it's online, so it means we can use it. Scan, I'll be talking about that another time. And config, I won't be talking about that another time as well, so don't worry about that too much. And then we've got a table, we've got a name. Well, again, it repeats the pool name. And you can see STB is indented here, and that's quite important. That shows that STB is subordinate or it's a child of test. And it tells us that the pool's online. Uh, again, you can't really tell immediately that test is a pool, apart from the fact that I've named it in capitals and the fact that it's further left than the next line down. So it's just, a, like I say, another little key, another little trigger to my mind that the test is the pool. So you can see the pools online and these columns here, read, write and check some, just show how many errors have been detected on the pool and in this line is on the block devices. So SDB, it's online and there's no errors obviously we just created it and it confirms it down here there's no known data errors and it's worth reiterating here at this point that ZFS is all about integrity data integrity it's not so much about speed if you're looking for speed you don't want to be using ZFS you want to be using another file system the data integrity thing is the thing that's utmost over anything else um, and I think this is why, for me, people who are on the internet saying, oh, you can do this to get a little bit more speed out of ZFS, uh, it doesn't really interest me. I, I want to know that my data is secure and I'm doing everything to mitigate any failure in the data. Um, yes, if somebody suggests that I try doing something a different way and it is fast, but also gives me more integrity in my data with ZFS then yes I'll, I'll have a go at it and see if it's true but um, if it's just purely for speed and I don't really need the speed um, and it's not giving me any more uh, protection of my data then you know it's no real concern to me. ZFS is all about data integrity it's about protecting your data that is the important thing and that is why when you do the status you're getting all this information about how many errors there are because that is the number one thing with ZFS. So I said I'll create a pool with without using dev 
So if I recall that command and just remove it. Now, if I run this now, it will tell me that it's already in use. Well, it says it's an unknown file system, funny enough, even though it is something it's created itself, but that's by the by. So what I'll do is I'll create one on SDC. And you see it hasn't come back with an error. By the way, you'll notice this is a lot slower because this is the disk that's got lots of remap sectors on it. So it's going to take a little while, this, unfortunately. Hopefully it will actually do it and not fail completely. Okay. All oh, right. Okay. So you can see I've already been playing around here. When it comes up with an error like that, you can use a... A flag called F. If I do the help again, if I do F called create, so we don't get the whole list of commands, you can see it just gives me the summary for the create commands. This uh, argument F will force what I've asked it to do. So um, if I put the F in, you can actually put a lot of the time, you can put these flags like a lot of Unix commands, you can put them anywhere really so I could put it at the end here and it will still act upon it but technically technically as you can see it's it's the wrong place to put it it should go directly after the create command so I will put it in the correct place but it will work if you just don't want to you know step the cursor back all the way to the beginning of the command you can put it at the end of the command it will work as I say it's best to follow what's specified because in the future that might change it might be a bit more strict about where the parameters appear and okay now that shouldn't happen it should actually do it oh yes sorry I know why it's because there's a pool name test already that's why so what I should do is create a new name that's what it is I am um, I thought it was an old test uh, an old uh, pool that I'd created earlier when I was uh, doing some testing on the um, on this disk that's faulty. But it's because there's a pool, as it says, <laughs> it already exists, the pool already exists. So I'm creating a new pool called Test2 on the SDC disk. Okay, and it's created it. So now if I do Z pool status, you can see that there's the original pool test on SDB, and now I've got another pool, a separate pool, um, with uh, test 2, call test 2, and it's using the SDC. But, you know, what I'm doing here is how we use disks with, you know, X4 and most other file systems. We create a file system per disk and that's not how ZFS works. ZFX work, ZFS works by putting together a load of disks and amalgamating all, all of the space on those disks and utilizing that space and making it available for any file system. So this is not how um, we want to be using ZFS. So what I'll do now is destroy these pools because I don't want to use them as they are and you'll see there's a a command called destroy and you can see it's a simple one you just supply the name of the pool as nothing else and if there's any warnings you know about um, destroying the pool if it's in use or anything again there's a F flag to try and force the destruction of the pool so I'll do Z pool destroy test to destroy the first pool and you see it does it straight away so if I do Z pool status you can see the test pool is gone but the test 2 still exists and now I can destroy the test 2 pool again it will take a little bit longer because of this faulty disk and now if I do Z pool status you can see it says there's no pools available um, so what I'll do now is I'll demonstrate creating a pool using a disk. Oops. So Z pool again, um, create, and this time you just specify the full path name to the disk. 
So I've put all my disks in this directory. Um, so I've got the full path in root, in my home directory, and ZFS, which is the subdirectory I've got, and then disk one is the file name. Um, sorry, and I've got to give it a pool name. So I'll just call it test again. And it's done it. So do zpool status. And you can see this time, instead of giving me the actual um, device name, it's given me the full path as I specified to the file. So that pool is using this file so if I was to do something like file disk one, I don't know what it would tell me. Well, it tells me it's data rather than, for example, file two. Oh, it tells me it's data anyway. But if I do f disk one cell um, disk one, oops, okay. I thought it might have given me a partition table. It if I look at the um, partition table of SDB, you can see it's created two partitions. It, this is what it does by default, ZFS. It creates a partition one, which has got the most of the disk space in, and it gives it this um, partition type. And um, the second, uh, sorry, the second partition is actually partition number nine. And it's only an 8 meg partition, it's, it's this Solaris Reserve partition. And you'll notice also that it creates a GPT um, partition table as well by default. So that's what um, ZFS has created. I'm, I'm, obviously it treats files slightly differently, the things it hasn't done the same with the file. So um, that's quite interesting. I hadn't hadn't realized that before but as you can see that it is it has created a pool and we can destroy it in exactly the same way as we did before um, just supply the name of the pool and it's destroyed I forgot to mention about these uh, pool commands or a couple of extra little commands that are quite useful um, the first one was the list command so if I create a pool called test again um, using oh, let's remove the devsta again remove all the devices so if I do zpool create a pool called test with sdb there's the list command which gives a nice little summary of um, yeah, you know, stuff about the pool. So you can see there's the name of it, there's the size of it, how much um, space has been allocated, and therefore how much is free. I uh, won't worry about these two. That's the fragmentation of the pool. Uh, generally, if you keep a pool under 80% capacity, um, you'll find this fragmentation will, won't go up or it'll barely go up. You know, that might go to 1% or 2%. Um, I have had a pool go up to 90% capacity and this has still remained low, but obviously that, that would depend on the type of files um, that you're storing on the pool. Um, DDAP is something I mentioned in a future video. Um, and obviously health online because I've just created it. Alt root I won't mention at all. Um, but yeah, and, and each, each pool you have would appear on a separate line. So if I create another one, called test two okay this is really taking a long time now it's slightly worrying okay it did do it um, if I do Z pull list now um, you can see the two poles one on each line with um, their respective bits of information. You also notice the allocated. Although I've done nothing to test to uh, to, to the test pool apart from create it, you'll notice the allocated size has gone down slightly. And these figures do 
adjust slightly as ZFS does things in the background um, in, and even the test two. Although they're identical disks in virtually every way apart from the second one's got errors, test two is actually using 2K less than test pool. So that's that. The other thing I wanted to show was um, how to recover from a pool that accidentally gets destroyed. Now I would assume that it would almost be impossible to destroy a pool accidentally. Um, it's something you wouldn't do too often in day-to-day -day management of a Z ZFS system. Um, but I guess it could be possible if you've got, for example, like I've got similarly named pools and you accidentally type in the wrong number, say test two instead of test three, for example, that you could inadvertently delete a pool. You don't get any warning, as you've seen, when you destroy a pool. There's no facility to force you to ask it to warn you, as, as for example, with the RM command in, in uh, Unix with the minus I. Uh, so... There is a way around it though, so, so if I destroy it, for example, test, destroy the test pool, if I just do a Z pool list, you can see it's gone. You can use, it's not intended to be used like this, but it's a side effect of it, I guess, Z pool import command, and if you supply a minus capital D, what this does, it scans all the disks on the system looking for potentially uh, for potential pools that could be imported that have been deleted. So you can see there's two here. Um, that's interesting. It hasn't listed my SDB. Oh, yes, there it is. Sorry. Yeah, there it is there. So you can see I've got another test too from stuff I've been doing previously on SDD. Obviously, I haven't done that on these videos. That's been when I've been testing things. So that's still there. But the one I've just deleted, which is the one I want, is this SDB. So to import that one, what you do is set pull, or to reactivate it, if you like, you do set pull import, supply this minus D, and then you, as it says here, use its numeric name, its name or numeric identifier, now, if these two pools had the same name, they obviously, it's ambiguous. ZFS wouldn't know, or the, the Z, more accurately, the Z pool argument wouldn't know which pool I meant, whether it meant this one or that one. So, the only way to import it would be to use this ID, and you'd use this Z pool import minus D command with that number. Because I've got distinctive pool names, I don't need to use that number. I can just specify the name that that pool was re referred to before. So I can do that. And now if I do Z pool list, or indeed Z pool status, you can obviously see that I now have both pools. Uh, available and the one that I deleted has been recovered and everything's intact. One thing you will notice is the allocated size has got jumped up. It went to 178k. It's now 148k but originally if I just scroll back a little bit it was 116k. Um, it was 128k when I created it but it settled down to 116k. So again it shows you things that are going on in the background uh, if I do a list again, it's still 140k. Um, in actual fact, I could mention a few other commands here, which will explain, partially explain that. Um, there are, uh, which one shall I explain? Yeah, I can explain the history command. So what this does, it displays the history for the polls and it shows you all the commands that have been run against the poll. Um, and this includes commands that uh, deal with the file system as well as the poll commands. So it keeps a log with a timestamp of everything that's done on the polls. So you can see this 
one here it's just been created nothing else been done to it whereas the test one you can see I've created it I've destroyed it and then I've re-imported it and activated it again with that command and if only you know these histories can be pages long if you only want to look at one particular pool just specify the pool name and you only get the history for that particular pool Um, every now and then the ZFS gets upgraded the effectively if you like the database version gets updated and new features get integrated into ZFS and although the programs are capable of, of more features the database the ZFS database doesn't get touched it remains at the um, version it was created with um, but when you do a Z-Pool status, you will get a warning uh, probably around where this config command is actually off the top of my head as I remember correctly, uh, saying that the pool can be upgraded to enable new features and that currently the pool is not using those new features. And to upgrade it, you just do Z-Pool upgrade and the name of the pool. So if I do this, obviously nothing will happen because... Um, I've just created them with the current version of ZFS um, and it tells me that, that it's got all the supported features enabled but that's how you upgrade the database like the data structures if you like of the pool um, when the ZFS programs have been updated and those updates include changes to the structures of the ZFS pool um, and those changes will be more features or, or different features so that's worth remembering well in fact like I say you don't need to remember it because when you do do the upgrade to the program when you do a Zeppel status it tells you that it, there is a chance that you could upgrade the database um, uh, to take advantage of new features um, there are a few other commands that we'll be explaining but not now because they're more pertinent to um, stuff we'll be covering in future videos um, the only other one I will mention now is the iostat command is quite useful what you can do is um, it's a typical sun command this is you could do zpool iostat and what it does if you type it in on its own it gives the um, average stats for each pool since power up effectively um, so you can see the capacity for each pool allocated and free the number of operations read write and operations and the bandwidth of each operation I think these are kilobytes per second and it might even be megabytes per second if they reach that high um, and likewise before, as before you can do it per pool you don't have to do the whole um, lot you know if you've got several pools you can just examine each one individually now that is the average since power up um, what you can do is put a figure in afterwards which is the number of seconds and specify that you want the status to update every so many seconds so I've told it to update the status uh, every five seconds and what happens now is the first line still gives the average since power up uh, again if you've been used to sun systems solaris systems you'll recognize this it's similar to other stat tools on the, on the solaris system subsequent lines are output at regular intervals that you specified but these are stats that only have uh, been summed during this period so in the first five seconds this number of uh, transactions occurred if you like and then in the next five seconds this number and so on so each five second slice is one row that's being printed to the screen um, so that's quite useful to have running in the background have it running another terminal if you want to monitor a, um, a command the ZFS command that you're running that's taking some time or even if you've got a program that's hitting the disk a lot you want to see how it's reacting uh, it's a good way of getting some feedback on not only the number of operations but the actual throughput uh, of the pool itself 
I tend to find that um, a period of about five minutes is quite useful. So that would be 300. So obviously this wouldn't now update for the next until five minutes have passed. Uh, and also 600 10 minute intervals quite a good period to to monitor but obviously it's whatever you want i mean it goes down to a second i believe is the minimum uh you know if you want that fine grained monitoring of of the uh subsystems going on and as you can see because i'm not actually doing anything with the pool the averages are going down because time's elapsing um, but there's no further data being written or read from, from the pool itself. So it's just a few extra commands that I wanted to mention to do with said pool. Well, that's more or less all I really want to mention. There are, as I say, other commands that I will be uh, talking about in future videos, but they're more pertinent to these other features that I'll be covering. And so I'll leave that till then.